Hello everybody and welcome back. Not only have I got a number of sightings for you, I have news of a new group on Facebook. It was set up by myself and Werewolf Mike. Um, we get so many Dogman reports and Werewolf reports that they come in. Um, it's more Mike's forte than mine, but as I take the reports and I deal with the witnesses, I don't really have a very good knowledge base. So that's how BBR started way back in the day. So we figured we'd start something for the uh, canid type of reports and get people talking and hopefully I can learn along the way with everybody else. And the group's called Werewolf Research. Um, and if you pop it in, you should find us on Facebook. It'll pop up. If not, just find me, uh, Deborah Crossley Hatswell, and I will direct you to the group. Um, it's a nice place. We've just been sharing some articles and some photographs and things like that. And it's a new group, so people are going to have differences of opinion. So... You know, we're all adults, we'll be fine. Um, but this, um, one of our friends on YouTube, Fuzzy Lou, sent over this article and posted it in the group, and it was really interesting. And it did interest, it got my um, interest because within a very short walk away, there is another account that came into Bigfoot Toner. Um, and I'll speak about that at the end, but here we go. And as I said, it didn't come into my uh mine it's it's from a blog and i've put a, li a link to the blog in the description below and it's a gentleman who's called daniel black and he's investigating and he says it was ten fifty eight on a dreary evening in late autumn 2001 when michael a's car drew to a halt on a desolate fen road several miles past 10 mile bank he recalls looking at the clock on the dashboard because he was running late and he was cursing the fog it was so thick that the road ahead disappeared after only about 10 metres. He said, I had no idea where the road was heading or how to get back. Turning around seemed impossible and at the time it seemed a stupid inconvenience. What happened next was to turn that evening into the one he would never likely to forget. Michael, a landscape gardener who was at the time lived in a village just north of Cambridge, and had been on his way to visit a friend in Wisbeck when he had taken a wrong turn in the rapidly thickening fog. The fog was taking him deeper into the fens instead of north into Wisbeck as he had hoped. With no lights to be seen but his own, he'd become anxious that the car could bear into one of the deep ditches that ran on either side of the road. Though he couldn't see them, he knew they were there, and they were often treacherous, and so he'd stop to take stock and consult his road atlas. He said, I realised that without some identifiable landmarks, the map wasn't going to be much use. So I flicked off the car lights in the hope of being able to see further into the fog, or maybe spotting any other lights that are out there. Now the moon was bright that night, and it gave this fog a strange luminosity. I couldn't see much further than before. Certainly not enough to pick out any kind of landmark in that featureless landscape. He then leaned over to pull out the road atlas from under the passenger seat. As I was leaning over, I heard and felt something brush against the outside of the car, just inches from my head. It sounded like a stiff paintbrush being dragged against the passenger door. Then almost immediately... Something caught the wing mirror as it passed. The wing mirror snapped back with a loud clunk. The night was utterly silent. No birds or traffic, not a sound. That sound of the wing mirror made me jump out of my skin. As he sat up, Michael explains, he recalls hearing another sound. He describes it as the same sound that my dog's feet make when it trots across the kitchen floor. Look out, looking out at the road ahead and half expecting to see a dog or a fox, he was surprised to see an upright figure standing in the middle of the road. It was tall, but hunched, about five metres from the front of the car. It looked like a man with his back to me, with his head down and his collar turned up. I thought, though, I couldn't quite make it out. Michael flicked the headlights back on and got the shock of his life it immediately turned and looked towards the car apparently startled its proportions weren't like that of a man the shoulders were very broad and its arms were much longer with an arched back 
Its head was large and pushed forward almost like a bear's. The lower body appeared hairy, but the head and neck were covered in shaggy grey fur. It looked damp and massive like the fur on a fox, and for a moment its eyes reflected in the headlight straight back like a cat or a dog's. I knew it was looking right at me, Michael said. After a second of hesitation, the figure dropped onto all fours and rapidly disappeared into the fog ahead. I heard its feet for a few seconds, muffled by the fog, and then it was gone. The clock now read 10.59. The entire encounter had lasted less than a minute. Afterwards, Michael reversed the car to a point where he could safely turn and headed back the way he'd come. I was just cutting my losses. After that, all I wanted to do was go home. Nevertheless, it was some time before the experience began to properly sink in. At that time, although it was very real, it had the quality rather like a dream. You know, when you just accept what's happening, however odd it is. But the next day, when I saw the wing mirror, still bent forwards, the reality of it really hit me, and the need for some kind of explanation would not go away. Now, explanations proved hard to find. Like a lot of people have experienced things they can't explain, Michael was reticent about making it public. He had nothing to gain from such a bizarrely, frankly bizarre story. Quite the reverse. And despite locating the spot and returning over a dozen times, he made only tentative inquiries, and even then, only anonymously, or with people he knew and trusted. People said it was a man walking a dog, or even a startled sheep, smiles Michael. I've seen a lot of people walking dogs, and a lot of sheep in my time. It wasn't either of those. But what was it? It was almost a year before Michael's story reached me, said David, and truly came under scrutiny into the public domain. And this happened quite by chance, while I was pursuing another apparently fruitless story on the southern edge of the fens. Chris Naylor was visiting friends out in the wilds near Burnt Fen, some miles from Ely, when soon after midnight on the 22nd of August 2002, they had heard some strange sounds somewhat like those of a dog outside the house. When the owner of the house shone a torch from the downstairs window, he glimpsed something very large and dog-like disappear through the gap in the hedge. Though it had clearly been disturbing for them, the phrase, like a dog, cropped up in a great deal in their testimony. So much so, said David, regrettably, there seemed to be only one conclusion to be drawn at that time. I felt, I left feeling convinced that they were an unfortunate victim of a local stray and black shuck mania. Afterwards, I was discussing the matter in the local pub with a friend and we talked about the recent phenomenon of the Fen Tiger and Black Shuck. A great black dog said to inhabit the Fens. Now, there have been numerous terrifying encounters with this beast since the earliest properly recorded sighting in 1570, and that was near Bungay in Suffolk, and that's the Bungay Beast. Now, this friend in the pub, it transpired, also knew a friend of Michael's and mentioned some of the details of his case. So he was concerned about tra- betraying a confidence. I made some subtle inquiries and met Michael two weeks later, who it turned out was very willing to talk. I had the impression that while he'd been reluctant to push his case before the public, it was a great relief to him that somebody had finally come to take the matter off his hands. That's exactly what it feels like. We talked several times over the next couple of weeks and he produced a drawing of what he had seen. It was all perfectly clear in his mind, even after many months, though he apologised for the quality of his drawing. I'm not an artist, he said. I I am firmly convinced that he believed in what he saw and that it was something quite real. Nevertheless, for the moment, as so often the investigation was at a dead end, a detailed account, but nothing more, really. But more was to come. Quite suddenly and quite unexpectedly, While I was pursuing other investigations in Scotland towards the end of September, 
I picked up a message on my mobile from Chris Naylor saying that the same disturbances had again occurred at approximately 1.30pm on the morning of the 22nd of September out in the Benz. When he joined his friend for a walk later that day, they had also found unusual large footprints, one whole and one partial, oh, and three partial, sorry, which they said they could not definitely identify as either animal or human. If they were made by a person, said Chris, then they were walking barefoot and had claws. These were found near a ditch on the edge of an open field, which, according to Chris's friend, tended to drain poorly during autumn and was often half full of water. Chris speculated that the creature had stopped here to drink. However, poor mobile reception had meant a significant delay in me receiving the message, and the day after the discovery, the footprints were already gone, the field having been freshly tilled. Most frustrating of all, no one had managed to take a photograph on Sunday because the battery in the only available camera was flat. Nevertheless, by the time I put myself on a train heading south, a little more would come to light. On the journey, I had another dramatic call, this time from my partner, Charlie Marlowe. A friend of Charlie's, a long-serving country vet, had called her with a curious story about a cow that had been found dead and severely mutilated at a farm in the fens. Both the farmer's dogs had refused to go anywhere near the carcass. The farmer had called the vet immediately. Several weeks had now passed since the original discovery, and the animal's body had long since been destroyed. But I'd seen mutilated cattle here before. I'd also seen them in Nevada, and it is an horrific sight. Ironically, the usual explanation for mysterious cattle mutilations is that it is a predatory animal. It was clear that here it really was an animal that was responsible. But neither the farmer nor our friendly vet could satisfactorily explain what animal, in England at least, could wreck such damage. Even more significantly, this was not known to the farmer, the vet or even to Charlie. The attack had taken place just hours after Chris Naylor and friend had heard those mysterious sounds on the burnt fence. In the early morning of the 23rd of August, which was only nine miles away from this carcass. But by the time I got back into East Anglia, there was far more dramatic news. Over the weekend of the 21st of September, the same farmer had another encounter, one that this time would not need to depend on anyone's drawing skills. The farmer, let's call him John, had been severely shaken by the attack and with a resourceless worthy, a true investigator immediately set about introducing security measures. The cattle were kept in a lock shed at night, opposite which there was already a security light. This is set off by movement in the yard. Anything bigger than a rabbit will set it off. On an adjacent barn, John installed a small webcam overlooking the yard, triggered by a simple light-sensitive switch. If the security light comes on, the webcam snaps high-resolution images every two seconds, saving them directly to the hard drive of the PC. It keeps this up until the light switches off again. Um, and it was on for approximately three minutes, unless the beam continues to be interrupted, in which it will continue to film. In the three weeks it had been in operation, it had snapped nothing but a few cats and the odd box. Then something much bigger made a visit. At 3.20am on the 22nd of December, again just a few hours after the second disturbance at Burnt Pen House, John was awoken by a loud crash. In the next few moments, he was convinced he could hear something moving outside. Looking out of all the windows towards the yard and the nearby cattle shed, he could see nothing, but the security light was on. By now, the sounds had stopped. John headed to the PC to see what, if anything, the camera had picked up. What he found was startling. At exactly 3.17, an upright figure enters the yard from the left, the drive leading to the road. And this figure triggers the security system. 
Seemingly unperturbed by the security lights, it stands for several seconds looking from side to side before moving further into the yard. And it stops again, dead centre, in the full beam of the light and appears to look at the camera. Then very suddenly and swiftly, it moves off to the light in the direction of the cattle sheds and the fields beyond. When I saw these images for the first time, I found it truly chilling experience. One can only imagine how John must have felt that night. The creature, whatever it was, had passed just yards from him only moments before. The first thing that struck him was the silence that followed and that the dogs hadn't barked once. He found them downstairs in the kitchen, cowering in a corner, their ears flat against their heads. Needless to say, he did not investigate further outside until daylight and he never did discover the source of the crash. There was no other sign of an intruder of any kind. What are we to make of these images? It's one of the sad ironies of investigation of this kind that even when we do get some kind of photographic evidence, we often lack the frame of reference that we need to make a reasonable interpretation, such as this case here. All we can say with any certainty, if we accept that all these instances are linked and there are good reasons to believe that they are, is that some nocturnal, fur-bearing creature, which walks upright, at least some of the time, and down on fours at others, is ranging across the fens between March, Ely and Thetford Forest. It seems more active around the full moon, although that may simply be easy to spot at these times because it's giving off more light. And if we look closely at the details of the reports, perhaps also display the hunting pattern, appearing in the north near Ten Mile Bank at around 11pm, moving down to Burnt Ben around midnight, one thirty, and looping up towards eastwards towards Thetford Forest by around about 3pm, a distance of over 20 miles. Uh, these are David's words, not mine, by the way. If we close this circle, we have an even longer circular route. I wonder if he meant 1.30am and 3am rather than p.m. because that would make more sense. There have been no wild wolves in Britain for centuries, but like them, our night prowler seems strongly territorial. What kind of creature can this be? Are we mistaken into thinking that all these sightings are even the same creature? Doesn't the logic of survival dictate that there must be more than one, he says? And does the answer perhaps lie in Thetford Forest? Daniel Black is an investigator with Marlowe Black, a Cambridge based agency. And you can contact him if you like at um, inquiries at marlowblack.co.uk and I'll add that link into the video description below. Um, now, just the use runs through this area, and as we've talked before, it's the rivers really we should be looking at, not the areas. Um, and there are so many at Thetford, it's unbelievable. And on the fens as well. And as I said, just to the south along the use, and it's a very short walk, is another sighting which was sent into Bigfoot Tony and he passed it on to me. And this was the red eyes of Welney Fen, and this was in the 90s. Um, and this is not the full story, but it's an account from a gentleman who's recalling his father's experience. Um, and all we've done is some grammar's been corrected for the purpose of better reading. Um, and it was in the early 90s, he said, and my dad was obsessed with Sasquatch and he'd read a lot. But he never did he suggest it was that. It wasn't until I heard a howl on YouTube and thought it sounded exactly the same that this came up. My dad had an experience he can't explain on his honeymoon. Himself and my mum, along with another fisherman, saw glowing red eyes blinking away on the fen. My dad is quite fearless with stuff like this, so we went over to see what it was in the dark. He followed the eyes for a good 45 minutes, and they were always keeping the same distance from my dad. He then decided enough was enough, and he ran at it, in a bid to outrun it to get a closer look, but nothing. Now, this was in the 1980s at a place in the fence called Wellner. My dad says most people take the piss when he's saying he was drunk. He's never drank and he's old school London, so he'll only say what he sees. Now, Wellney Fen is a 300 acres of restored wetlands and it's home to thousands of bird species and it connects to the River Ouse 
which runs out to sea. So it's an ideal habitat between land and shore. And not only that, not too far away, you've got the Helm Fen woodblocks, woodnocks, if you think about it, if you just follow the use down. Um, and this report, if I remember, came from a gamekeeper, and it says this account came in through my report, a Bigfoot Facebook sighting page on um, Facebook. And the gentleman said, I was recently down at Home Fen, which is an area of special scientific interest and an area which I visited hundreds of times. The woods here are diverse and full of silver birch, beech and oak trees. Wildlife abounds with many species of native and visiting bird. The area has fisheries and the Great Fen is a 50-year project to create a huge wetland area. And it's one of the largest restoration projects um, of its type in Europe. When I was there, I heard knocking on the trees, a distinctive knocking. It was a double knock, which I know was not deer or humans messing about. This knock sounded like wood on wood, as if someone or something was knocking on the tree. It stood out, and I think it was meant to. I have a background in cake gamekeeping, so I'm used to the usual noises you'd hear outdoors in nature. This was different, and it stood out. What I heard was unusual enough that I felt very uneasy when I heard the sound. It intrigued me and worried me at the same time. As I walked, I kept looking everywhere, but all I could see were monk jack deer, which seemed to be acting in an uneasy manner, almost unsettled. I kept visiting the site and will continue to do so, and I'm sure that something strange happened on this day, something out of the ordinary. I just thought I'd share this with you and I'll keep you updated if anything else happens. Now, this just seemed to be an emerging pattern with the sightings and something worth noting, I think, is that it seems to be in areas with estuaries and obviously the rivers that run into, there are numerous sightings along those rivers themselves. And they're not too far from the Wash um, Nature Reserve there. And a very short trot from all of the accounts at Hepford, uh, Hepford that we spoke about. And then you have the Standing Wolf accounts um, at RAF Alconbury, which brings up another subject, I suppose. Um, a lady called Sarah got in touch with me this today, and she was explaining to me at Salt Fleet Marsh, the area where there have been a number of sightings that are suddenly being posted and cannot be used. And the reason it's been given is for the safety of the public. Um, and there's lots of areas that seem to be being either bought up or posted as um, areas of special scientific interest, areas of geo interest or of danger to the public. And they are posted as private and we can no longer use them. Um, which is very strange. So do you know of any areas like that where there's been a sighting report um, and all of a sudden you can no longer access the wood? Eskew Woods um, springs to mind immediately. That's on a corridor and it has a sighting and that's been bought up and you can't use it anymore. So it's something interesting um, to leave us with, isn't it? So more dogman sightings to come and more British Bigfoot sightings. Um, and as I say, there's a new group, so onwards and upwards for 2019. So until next time, thank you very much. Good night.